Excellent. Thank you all very much. I am excited to talk to you today about a lot of different things. And so I think the way that we have it set up is that I'll start with kind of a 30,000 foot level and then each speaker will kind of drop down a few notches so that by the end, uh, I think you're going to have a nice continuum of a lot of the issues that we need to collectively discuss. So I wanted to start with this slide. The times, I think, are more than a changing. They, uh, they're sort of, you know, we're kind of reeling from so much change. And I don't just mean the politics uh, that we're experiencing here in the U.S. We had a, a presidential election. You're seeing incredible breakthroughs in science. Um, we're seeing major disruption in terms of the way that uh, direct-to-consumer is happening, whether it's how we've seen transportation disrupted. You even see, you know, ball gowns that you can get off the internet and not pay for. Um, I just saw Guardians of the Galaxy this weekend, so Groot used to be big. If you've seen this movie, now he's little. I mean, everything is different. We see Brexit. I, don't, I had to do that, right? Um, Fitbit in terms of the way that we're collecting health information. Uh, and then, you know, I put the Snapchat icon. If anybody has uh, teenagers in their lives, or maybe you're using it yourself, the way that we're consuming information and the way that we are kind of holding on to information has dramatically changed. So I have a 14-year-old daughter, and of course the thing that terrifies parents about Snapchat is that it allegedly can disappear, so you can't really monitor your kids anymore because they're exchanging messages and there's no record of it unless it's screenshotted. So I think in total there is so much going on right now, and probably at any point in history, somebody could put their slide up and, and have a lot of change. But the implications for science and research and cures to patients uh, are, you know, fairly unique and awesome. So how do we work to get faster cures? And that's the name of my organization. This is kind of our tagline, which is, you know, there's, if there's 10,000 diseases out there and we only have 500 treatments and cures, then there's a lot to be done to start to fill that gap. The, the whole origin for my organization, Faster Cures, is to try to look at the research system and understand what are the obstacles to progress. You know, how can we make something go more quickly, whether it's through uh, gains in efficiency or uh, effectiveness. So we're a not-for-profit. We're based here in Washington, but we're part of a group that's uh, primarily located in California called the Milken Institute. And these are the three programmatic areas that we work in. And we, are, we don't have an endless budget or an endless footprint, so we've tried to narrow in. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that we're doing and how they're relevant to the change that I talked about. So the first one is patients count. This is this emerging area of the science of patient input, and I'll talk a bit about that. The second is our kind of bread and butter R&D policy. And there is a lot going on there. Uh, there's funding challenges and a little bit of uncertainty, um, and we'll hear from Lyric about you know, some of the broader issues that the NIH is looking at. There's, we just had an FDA commissioner uh, who was voted yesterday, Scott Gottlieb, who's joining the FDA, and we have a new administration that I don't know we, if we understand completely what the tea leaves are about the FDA, and I think that's part of the change equation is that it's a little hard to read those tea leaves to understand what all of this will mean. And then in terms of R&D policy, I think there's increasing globalization. And so for the work that you all are doing, it's obviously not just the US market that you need to worry about or think about. It's more broadly um, European, international policy. The last program that we have is called Collaboration 2.0. And this is really looking at the emerging science of how do we collaborate, how do we get more done together, and what are the barriers to doing that? And I can say that in the relatively short time frame that Faster Cures has existed, which is about 14 years, we've seen a pretty dramatic change in the evolution of that, that idea of collaboration. I think even 14 years ago, if you can think back, it's not that long ago, you know, there was still a little low-hanging fruit left, I think, for drug development. Um, you know, maybe the money challenges weren't the same. Uh, maybe we hadn't quite started talking about the demise of venture capital money into some of the, these fields. Um, so what we have seen is as there have been shifts, 
you've had to see collaboration happen because there really wasn't any alternative. So we've looked at that science of collaboration and really tried to analyze both how has it happened, but what, what tips do we have and best practices for those trying to do it. So this is a schematic of the biomedical innovation system as we look at it. I'm sure there are you know, sectors in there that are probably missing, but I think this kind of covers the gamut of it. And the work that we do at Faster Cure is we try to put ourselves in the middle and understand a bit of everybody's perspective. But we do it with the patient in mind. We don't represent individual patients. We work with a lot of patient organizations, but we really try to understand that, that vantage point. I think that we need to be cautious of um, oversimplifying what does the patient want, and there's been a really healthy um, sort of change in some of that dialogue from, you know, this kind of motherhood and apple pie way of looking at it. Oh, I do everything on behalf of the patient, which I think we've gotten past that a little bit, but for a while you could hear pretty much everybody did everything on behalf of the patient, but I don't think that was actually true, or maybe they thought they did, but they really weren't doing anything specific. Um, so you have a lot of CEOs of major companies. Oh, we're patient-centric because we produce products on, you know, for patients. Well, now you have this science of patient input where we're actually trying to understand from a patient perspective and a preference, what are they looking for? And um, I also think there's been a really interesting, you know, sort of nuance that I've witnessed where the venture philanthropy disease research foundations who do work on behalf of patients and have pushed, you know, significant change forward, um, they're being looked at as keepers of patients in some settings, and people are saying, oh, I'd like to find the almost treatment-naive patients, you know, the patients, literally, I heard this, in the wild versus the patients in the zoo. So there's even some kind of parsing of how we're looking at that issue. So I want to start with some of the policy work that we've been doing, and I'm going to kind of go broad um, at the start. This is the cover of a report that we produced at the last summer before the election in the US, and it's called Prescription for Innovation. When we thought about a contribution that Faster Cures could make to the next administration, we thought, well, we have access to a lot of different thought leaders across you know, the whole uh, system. So we you know, tried an experiment, and we invited many people that we knew to join us for maybe a 30, 45 minute interview and share with us what they thought uh, you know, would be of relevance to the next administration. And this was pre-election, so no one knew what the outcome was. And we got over 150 people to agree to do these interviews, so you can look at this report on our website. We don't attribute quotes or specific data points from individuals, so the, the comments were aggregated, but we have an appendix that you can see everybody that we talked to. This represents all of the different sectors that we looked at. Uh, we really, you know, have strong uh, connections into the patient organizations. We talked to a lot of different levels of people in industry, um, other types of health advocacy, not-for-profits, academia, a little bit of government. We tried, we weren't afraid to ask people in government, but we didn't want to put people in a weird position. So we didn't, I wouldn't say we oversampled at FDA or NIH because we felt like it was putting people in a kind of strange position. But we did talk to some former, you know, senior level government folks, former institute directors from NIH, former FDA commissioners. So this is one of the macro level themes that came out of our interviews. And I'm gonna kind of break it down for you and give you the themes, uh, the seven themes that we came up with. So there was this theme of this, you know, incredible new frontier of discovery. And that relates to the times are a change in slide in that there, you know, everybody kind of universally agreed the science is unbelievable. We don't really know what's possible. We hope it's all gonna be happening quickly so that you know, we can see the benefits happening. But there was this really strong theme of it didn't happen by accident in the US and we could lose it uh, with, without you know, really paying attention to it. And there was, I think, a very high level of sophistication of what are, what's the recipe for keeping it, whether it's funding, whether it's policies, whether it's um, you know, really just paying close attention. So that was, I thought, useful for you, this conversation, this idea that people really felt strongly the administration needs to understand this is not something you take your eye off of, and you, you definitely want to, you know, sort of water and give it fertilizer. 
So these are the seven recommendations that we came up with. And I'll start at the top. I'm not going to go into each of the sub bullets. But there is a real hunger for, can we please think about these issues in a more systematic way? Can we create an innovation system? And it wasn't that people were saying, oh, we think government's the answer to all of our problems. But they were saying, you know, we're ready. We're tired of everything being siloed. We want regulatory talking to, you know, science funding and, and, you know, we want all this patient stuff kind of brought in across the board, not just at FDA. So there was definitely this sense of this is a real opportunity. And that's something that we've been strongly communicating to the Trump administration that innovation is in, in the biomedical research area is, you know, something that you can really make uh, positive strides on. Now, the next one is something I've talked a little bit about, patient centricity. It was really building off of this notion of, you know, we've been making progress here. But the thing that was a little different that we heard is a theme that was raised called, that we're calling health citizenship, that we're ready in the ecosystem for a two-way street conversation. So it's not just everyone saying, uh, yeah, we're going to tell the patients what's right for them, and we're going to do it all for the patients. It's also extracting kind of from the patients, what do you want? And giving them, you know, kind of their appropriate seat at the table. So interestingly, again, with the times being uh, kind of full of change, we've actually caught a little bit of, you know, flack for the term health citizen because people feel like, oh, citizenship is very loaded right now with the immigration debate. We've sort of said, you know, we, we refuse to stand down from the idea that it's okay to talk about being a citizen. Uh, that we're not meaning it in any, you know, kind of exclusionary way. But to me, that was evidence of how um, everyone is so nervous about so many things right now. The next one is regulatory resources, really a strong theme of, you know, the FDA has been doing pretty well. It's not the root of all evil, uh, you know, and that is not, I think, the case, what you would have heard a decade ago, where, you know, the FDA was kind of the the boogeyman for a lot of people's problems, whether that was accurate or not. There really was a sense of the FDA's come so far, we need to make sure that it has appropriate funding and that we really think carefully about kind of how can it uh, further innovation and not stand in the way of. Translational research, you know, there were some, some good recommendations there. Clinical trial, evolution and reform, uh, you know, obviously people brought a lot of thinking around big data, how can we harness it, how can we be thoughtful, what would be policy um, levers that could be pulled. And then the last one, which is something that people identified as the next valley of death, and that was access. And actually, Faster Cures was invited to meet with Secretary Price uh, last Friday with a few other groups, and he met with a group of patient organizations, and we brought forward some of this thinking that there was the sense that CMS has kind of been let off the hook. They're not thinking about patients, even though obviously what their policies are will have great impact on patients. So we brought forward some of that thinking and you know, hand delivered this report to him. So are there examples of the policy community coming together? Well, yes, there are. So I don't want to give you the sense that all that change has to be negative. Uh, because what we witnessed in December and this long period, you know, kind of leading up to it with the 21st Century Cures Act, I think was a very optimistic example of how you can have uh, a scientific audience, a patient audience, you know, sort of an a industry audience, government, Congress, uh, the administration really coming together around a common goal. Does the 21st Century Cures Act represent everything that everybody wanted? Absolutely not. But did it make some positive strides? We feel yes, and we were you know, proud to have been a part of it. Um, we have put together something on our website I wanted to make sure that you knew about, which we call our tracker. So we were kind of keeping it on our own spreadsheets, you know, what the bill said, and then where were we in the process of implementation. And I said, look, if we've got this on a spreadsheet, why wouldn't we just open source this and let everybody in on this? Um, so it's been interesting, I have to say as a side note, that some consulting firms have approached us and said, um, you know, can we, can you make it importable? Meaning, like, can we turn it into our product? But we want it to be out there for everyone. So um, take a look at it. 
it is being updated. Some of the stuff, you know, the deadlines aren't for a good long while, but we've gotten really nice engagement from the agencies that are, you know, tirelessly working on implementation who are talking to us and saying, okay, this is something that's happening that's going on behind the curtain. We put up there all the disclaimers of saying, you know, we're not privy to all of the, the things going on, and we definitely didn't want this to be used as a, some sort of a, you know, blunt instrument against the agencies. This is more of an open source, everybody take a look. But I think people should feel really proud of that. So where do patients fit into the equation? This is just a concept, I talked a little bit about some of the health citizenship work that we've done, but um, we did a paper in science translational medicine uh, from passengers to co-pilots, and that's gotten a fair amount of traction because we kind of explain the evolution of this patient-centric role and model. So take a look at that. I think that you really are starting to see a healthy, um, you know, kind of arrival of what does this look like, both in terms of concrete examples where it makes a difference, but how do we actually turn it into some sort of regulatory imperative so that the return on investment is clear from the industry standpoint? Because if it's not, if the FDA can't really articulate what they're looking for, you know, the concern that I have raised is that we could see the whole thing go away, which is not something I think anyone wants. One of the other ways that we engage with understanding what's happening in terms of the disease foundation community is through an affinity network that we call our train central station, train um, network. So if you take a look at our website, there's a ton of different resources. We try to aggregate best practices. When we first started doing this work, the groups wanted to learn from each other. So that was you know, mainly the express purpose. But what has happened since is that industry really wants to learn about this model, um, you know, other partners. And so, again, it's all kind of up there, open source, curated. There's a um, network of these groups that you can go in. There can be, you know, surveys and queries. But we do a lot of work on behalf of those groups so that they don't have to spend their time, you know, kind of explaining the model. Now, collaboration, do we have a path forward? I, I mentioned that I was going to talk a little bit about this work. We've done a number of things in this space of looking at the public-private partnerships, the consortium model. So we built, we had a, a series of activities, but we built a catalog of all of those consortia that you can go into if you wanted to see, um, you know, who's doing anything in lung cancer. You could search and come up with what are the consortia models that are approaching that. And that was an interesting experience for us because I think despite all of the data that, you know, we have it available to us, you know, some of this stuff, nobody's taking the time to curate it or figure out how to put it out there for everybody to have a look-see. And it surprised me the number of for-profit entities or government bodies that came to us and said, please, can you create this because we don't know who's doing the work in, you know, you pick the space. Um, I also think that it has helped already for a lot of the different partners who are working in consortia to understand how there is so much duplication and how we need to be a little bit smarter about how we're allocating our resources. So uh, let me, uh, I can't go backwards. Uh, so the highlights of the consortia outputs, this is supposed to be a slide that you can build and I don't think it's going to allow me to do that. but. Uh, basically, we break it out in terms of the way that the consortia are structured. What are they trying to accomplish? So again, Consortiapedia, if you go on the FasterCures.org site, you can um, search to your heart's delight on that. And right now, what we're doing um, with the support of the Helmsley Charitable Trust, they have a strong interest in, you know, kind of the science of collaboration, doing a series of activities to try to understand, are there, you know, kind of templates that would help others who are starting into some of these areas. I want to close with a couple of quotes. So this is actually a couple of years old, and, and if you've heard uh, Dr. Collins speak, you've probably heard him say something about how, you know, this is the time. And I think I want to impart to all of you, as the other panelists are going and as we get into the conversation, that you know, you're not passive observers in this whole process. You're all uh, stakeholders, whether you're receiving NIH funding, whether you're working with the FDA, whether, you know, you're a patient organization, nobody gets a, um, you know, a free lunch on this one. And I think now is more important than ever that you all exercise your voice in terms of whatever the policy would be, whether it's you want more funding going somewhere or you think a policy is standing in the way of innovation. 
um, it, it's, I think it's the time to really get smart about what you think and how you want to activate that voice. The, I'll, I'll end with, again, a quote from our work, RX for Innovation. Our competitive advantage is brain power and the American spirit of entrepreneurialism. That's where all our innovation has come from. Let's make sure this country stays ahead. Now, I don't put that because I'm trying to be, um, you know, sort of pro-America at the expense of anybody else. I'm saying one of the themes that I heard from, in fact, a noblest that we interviewed was there is something so extraordinary about the way innovation and entrepreneurialism and science and you know, the biotechnology industry have all evolved here. It's not to say that there isn't great power and promise elsewhere, but I don't think anybody knows what that formula looks like if we take the U.S. system out of the equation or we diminish it. So I, I just want people to stay focused on, um, certainly, you know, as Lyric joins us, uh, the, the NIH investment in science, if you start altering that structure, um, I don't think we want to necessarily know what that looks like. So I'll end here, and I look forward to um, having a group discussion once we're all finished. Thank you. Thanks, Margaret. Uh, so uh, are there any pressing or specific questions that you want to uh, pose for uh, Margaret before we move to the next? talk. There'll be lots of opportunity to, uh, to raise issues and, and ask questions afterward. Uh, so let me introduce then the second speaker. Uh, Martin Mensa uh, is principal scientist uh, uh, drug discovery at the CF Foundation. Um, he's been part of the spearheading effort by the foundation to uh, at least face one of the uh, one of the logistical problems of delivery of, of uh, innovation to patients with CF. Um, and their approach has been to, to uh, develop their own in-house uh, research uh, program in addition to uh, their standard uh, research program, which depends on funding from lots of places. But they've decided as a foundation that they need to soup up their own research effort on their own. Uh, and that's led to a, a research facility at the CF Foundation, uh, which is independent and uh, which will allow really more effective uh, delivery of therapy for CF and obviously for other disorders uh, that they will eventually get involved in. So um, uh, Martin is uh, up to his ears in uh, developing concepts for rapid delivery and more efficient delivery of uh, therapy for diseases, and we look forward to hear, hearing uh, how the CF Foundation is delivering on that. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Ted, um, for the introduction. And I must say, this is a talk that's unusual for me as a lab head. I typically give much more science-heavy talks, so today I'm here to really tell you more why we built this lab and how we use it to break down barriers and the lab, of course, mostly serves preclinical barriers, but I will also not just talk about the lab, but give you also some idea of what else the foundation is doing to break down barriers on the path to bring therapies to patients. So my title, therefore, is Bench to Bedside Acceleration of Novel Therapies. That's uh, Cystic Fibrosis Foundation approach. And I will <coughs> sort of briefly talk about the disease and epidemiology, then uh, have a summary of barriers that we have identified that we are working on, that we have worked on. And then, of course, there will be a section on the lab and what role the lab plays in this. And then I will also talk about sort of overcoming barriers in the clinical development, which is, of course, at the end, uh, what needs to be accomplished uh, to bring uh, therapies to patients. So here briefly the disease and epidemiology. So cystic fibrosis is an autosomal recessive genetic illness that uh, causes progressive lung disease and typically results in early death for patients. People more familiar with the disease, of course, know that um, there's also GI impact. Uh, there's a CF-related liver disease, CF-related diabetes. So it's really a multi-organ system, but it's a lung that drives morbidity, and most of the therapies that have been developed so far are all looking at improving functional outcomes for the lung. The disease can be caused by over 1,700 uh, genetic variants that have been described. Um, that's 
daunting right there. The, maybe a good thing is that 70% of all disease alleles are the most common, the deletion of the af 5 del which is therefore by just binomial distribution found in 90% of all patients. So 50% of them are homozygotes, the other 40 have at least one copy of that uh, disease allele. But um, it also means there is another 1,700 uh, mutations which have much smaller patient groups and certainly not all of those can be treated in the same fashion. There are currently 34,000 patients in the US. Significant improvements largely driven by the foundation in therapies and outcomes over the last 40 years um, have resulted in an increase in mean uh, predicted survival from 17 years in 1970 to 40 years in 2015. Actually, 2015 was a real milestone for us because we have now more adults living with the disease than there were children. That's first that mark was hit in 2015. So then barriers that we have identified in uh, that slow down new therapies. Here's this blue box are what I consider sort of preclinical uh, in the discovery site. So there's the translation of academic research into doc and, and therapy discovery. Um, we fund a lot of academic research. There's essays developed in academia, but these are rarely immediately ready for industry. Um, they're just kind of more one-off assays and don't have the robustness to perform in the industrial setting necessarily. There's also a lengthy MTA process um, or licensing process if biotech or pharma looks to bring in assays and reagents from academia. Part of the problem is that there's often a discrepancy in valuation of what the universities want for these technologies versus what pharma thinks they are worth. And there's also IP concerns. Um, many academic labs are not particularly worried about you know, what technology they use, but uh, of course most technologies are owned by somebody and if a pharma or biotech doesn't have a license to this technology, they may not be able to use reagents that work fine in an academic setting. Then there's general access to relevant models, cell lines, assays and reagents, um, which are important to do proper drug discovery and therapeutic development, um, but not everybody easily has access to those. So the blue box is something we're looking to address with the lab. Then there's identification, of course, of new approaches and technologies. As I said, there's 1,700 mutations. Some of them are intronic and splice and, and promoter regions, which certainly we will not be able to easily tackle with small molecules. Um, so we need sort of the technologies that are mostly being discussed here at this conference. And then getting to now in my yellow box, so the barriers in the clinical trial um, side of things, there is of course, the expertise in clinical trials, the trial design, acceptable endpoints, and also how these trials need to be powered so that they can be successful. It's not something that's obviously available to every smaller company or biotech that wants to run these trials. Um, for the many trials that we're actually now dealing with, we need many qualified trial sites and sites that can, from site to site, uh, produce reproducible outcome measures. Um, Patient recruitment is a big one. Um, I saw that on Margaret's slide also. And uh, then sort of a specific challenge to CF and probably some other orphan diseases that there's many genotypes with very small patient numbers. So traditional clinical trials, you know, that can be run for cholesterol or COPD just don't work in CF because there's not the numbers of patients available. So then I next We'll talk a little bit about the lab. This is just the outside of the building that we moved into in December 2015 in Lexington, Massachusetts. And the lab was conceived internally at the foundation in 2011 uh, with sort of a couple of different objectives. One is to accelerate the transfer of academic research into industrial drug discovery. So we are actively funding as a foundation over 350 academic research grants. Uh, our grant terms usually include a free license to us to the technology and assets that we help fund develop. And so we can bring these technologies if they promise to be useful in drug and therapy development to the lab and develop them into medium or high throughput assays. Um, we can avoid sort of the IP encumbrance that sometimes makes transfer to uh, biotech or pharma difficult. We redevelop cell lines with technologies that is not encumbered. Then in proof of concept internal screening campaigns. We also verify that these assays basically live up to industry standards. And then eventually we can transfer assays and reagents, primary cell lines, cell lines, plasmids, whatever, to interested parties. 
Um, the lab serves as a re research hub, so we provide on-site and hands-on training in all assets and techniques that are mastered in the lab. There's a free sharing of protocols, expert advice and consulting to anybody who wants it. We serve as a reference lab, so if smaller entities, academic labs or startups, um, have ideas about uh, you know, therapeutic regions or approaches, they can come to us and we benchmark those in our assets against sort of established treatments. And in that vein, these companies uh, or parties can work with us to actually generate proof of concept data for their therapeutic approaches without the need to develop and, uh, and spend time and money uh, to develop internal CF assays. Of course, in the same vein, that helps us to potentially de-risk our investments because these companies a lot of times come to us first to generate proof of concept, but then they would like to work with us and receive funding. Um, and if we already know if it's working or not, um, you know, we have a less risky investment. The lab is also serving as a site of external validation for more advanced compounds and therapies. So companies have come to us you know, this compound that they think they want to take into the clinic, but they want to get a final read on an independent site. And then, so the last objective for us is also internal research as a gap filler, um, for lack of a better word here. But so in our internal research, we basically tackle questions and approaches that we think are important, but they're not necessarily being picked up elsewhere in academia or biotech. And in that, Rome, I also categorize that we do alternative approaches to drug discovery, so we use screening assays that are not used elsewhere, and um, so it's kind of what I say here as gap filler research. What is important, all the work that we do at the lab and service that we provide are completely free to external parties, so we just do a simple MTA and return data with no strings attached. We don't do CRO work, so we don't want to be paid, which also means we don't really want to be held by anybody to tight timelines, I mean, we feed this all into our work, but we typically work very quickly with parties. Um, but we certainly are avoiding to become an integral part of any one drug discovery or development program so that we retain neutrality and everybody feels comfortable working with us. Um, here just briefly, so it's a few pictures from the lab. We began working in the lab in 2012, moved to a 20,000 square foot purpose built a facility in 2015. One of the big improvements for us was we had before just four biosafety cabinets for cell culture work. We went up to 17, because um, really a lot of the work comes back to cell culture. We, in the space, we have seven offices and 39 workstations, so room for up to 46 employees in the current layout. And science that we carried out already in a smaller site before we moved was looking for additional ways to find new uh, chemical matter for modulators for our most common mutation, the deletion of f 5 del And we had also started a screening program to look for compounds that uh, promote reads through of premature truncation mutations. In the new lab, then, we brought in stem cell biology, so we have a stem cell group now that um, eventually will work probably also on cell therapies, but right now we're using it more to develop new tools with a cell bank. Um, we use gene editing in the tool development, but also with the aim to understand gene editing better once therapeutics are really more ready for prime time. Um, we've brought in sequencing and therotyping is actually a big effort for the foundation overall and the lab has its role in it, which um, that's a term that maybe not everybody's familiar with, but for us it means testing approved uh, therapies. Right now we have the vertex therapies, of course, and see how well do they translate to other mutations um, of the about 800 missense mutations and mutations that are in the open reading frame of the CFDR gene and that can relatively easily be tested in sort of cDNA overexpressing systems. Um, that all requires a team. Currently there's 26 of us at the lab and the group continues to grow. And just before I move on to other things in the lab, I want to give you one specific example of how we're looking to break down barriers. So the field has relied very heavily on primary cells from lung explants, and there's sufficient availability of those for the most common mutation, the F5O8 uh, del de Lish. Hmm. But when we now work on nonsense mutations, uh, there's already far in between. There's very few lungs that are homozygous for uh, X mutations, 
most of them are heterozygous with one copy of Fi for Adele, and that, of course, in sort of development assays makes for con confounding readouts. And cDNA expression of these uh, mutants doesn't really model all the biology that's needed to, to develop uh, therapeutics. So in order to sort of fill this hole, we're working on developing inexhaustible supplies of relevant surrogate systems for preclinical work. And so we have embarked on footprintless gene editing of the native CFDR locus in either immortalized cell lines or iPS cells. And we have already generated multiple cell systems so that are now homozygous for nonsense mutations, which, again, we are happy to share with anybody. And in parallel, we're also working on a rare cell collection of nasal cells, rectal biopsies, and um, other you know, blood from patients, so sort of renewable sources in a way. But um, we are banking that, and, uh, you know, we have the advantage of being able to find patients, for example, that are homozygous for a rare mutation through our patient registry, which I will get back to in a little bit. Uh, this is just a slide showing that we are certainly quite embedded in the community, so all the dark blue with names on these are PIs um, in the US and outside the US that we've already worked with, and then in yellow there's companies that we've already had engagements with. Some companies just one time, others um, in repeat interactions, but the lab is definitely quite interactive with the research community. And then, you know, that was my one point about finding new technologies, um, so the foundation started already in 1998, the therapeutic development program that was a consequence of after the gene was cloned in 89 and like almost a decade of failures in gene therapy when everybody thought we quickly have a therapy after the gene was originally identified. And the, the leadership at the time under Barbell decided we need to really do other things and start a small molecule program. And that first contact was actually with Aurora Bioscience that then later became Vertex. Um, but really, this program was created to encourage industry and academia to focus on CF as a disease and CFDR as a drug target. And so components of this program to, until today pro include financial assistance to the parties that want to get into CF research. And we provide research tools and have also a scientific advisory group that usually accompanies these, these programs. Um, only last year, you see, we spoke to 130 companies that we didn't interact with before. Um, some come to us, well, let's say many come to us, but we also look actively for companies with technology that we think may be useful. And uh, we're currently providing funding to 34 industry programs. So now, um, in the last bit, I'm going uh, to talk about the clinical trial aspects. So this obviously with uh, the drug development, the need for effective and efficient clinical trials uh, with only 34,000 patients in the US. And, um, Quite a few of them are not available for clinical trials, either for age, severity of illness, genotype, you know, inclusion criteria, and targets are usually relatively tight. And then some of the genotypes are also widely spread uh, geographically, so it's quite impossible almost to bring enough patients to just a few clinical research sites. So here, this just gives you a quick shot at our current pipeline. So any bar that doesn't come up to the basically dashed line at the second one from the top uh, represents a clinical trial or trials that are ongoing. So there's uh, CFDR function restoration, but also a bunch of different um, symptomatic treatments. And so all these trials demand patients, clinical research sites, uh, staff that uh, handles these trials. And um, here's just another view. So compared to 2013, actually in the last few years, our clinical trial demand has doubled. And that, um, I don't take any credit for this, it was definitely foresight from the leadership at the time. In parallel, when they started the therapeutic development program, they also started a therapeutic development network, which is basically a network of clinical sites. So seven were there originally, and now we had 89 different sites across the US that uh, can do standardized uh, readouts. I mean, not every center does all the same trials, but um, there's basically 89 sites that we can rope in. There's a coordinating center in Seattle that has a biostatistical unit that helps sort of with the trial design and powering of the trials, an independent data safety monitoring board. And the center we are now supporting with like 20 to 25 million annually. And that's still kind of tight in our network, so we're also working with European partners networks to meet our increased demand. 
And here's just a map showing where all the centers are throughout the years. So we're really trying to cover also the geography where the patients are. And um, then just one slide on uh, another very important tool that has been developed over 20 plus years, which is the CF Foundation Patient Registry. So that, of course, allows for epidemiologic research, informed study design, is a great query tool to find for people that are eligible for trials. And um, you know, it, it, we can find control groups. It's good for phase four studies. And over 90%, I think, of all the CF patients in the US are part of this registry. I mean, they can actively opt out. Uh, but the very majority is participating in that. And then lastly, before I end, I want to give you one other example of how actually with relatively little effort one can break down barriers. And this is just our recent redesign of our clinical trial finder for CF. This was a tool that was on our website available for a long time, but really didn't see much use. And then we relaunched a new cl clinical trial finder early this year. And you can see basically up the months before the trial finder was launched, there were only 83 page views. With the new tool, we uh, had 26,000, uh, over 26,000 in the first month. And we had hoped maybe for a tenfold improvement, but this was really a massive uh, gain and surprising to us also. But in summary then, there are many challenges and barriers along the path to bringing new therapies to patients, of preclinical I talked about and to clinical as well. Um, some of the challenges can be overcome with relative ease. I mean, this redesigned clinical trial finder is definitely not the most costly or lengthy undertaking that we took. Others, of course, take years and decades to be addressed, like our clinical research site network or the patient registry. I mean, other organizations cannot just replicate something like that overnight. But really, for me, of all the most important take home is that one needs to forecast and anticipate barriers and act on them as early as possible so that they do not become roadblocks. So we are actively speaking to the FDA, for example, on how can we handle the small patient groups that may need special trials, end of one patient trials, and so we have workshops that are initiated from our end, and we try to pave the way for companies when they get to that point that they need to develop the therapies. And with that, I end, and but I'm happy to participate in the panel discussion later. Um, Thank you, Mark. Again, uh, any uh, urgent and uh, um, specific questions that we can pose at the moment? Right. Yes, question, please. It seems like a um, three or four order of magnitude improvement in the effectiveness of your clinical trial finder is something that shouldn't go without a little more comment. How did that happen? What was the what brought about that improvement? Yeah, it's, I'm not sure I'm the most qualified person in our organization to answer that specific question, but I think it's the presentation where it was on the website, it was definitely put in a more prominent spot, but also just the usability of the tool. I mean, it, uh, the query uh, for location specific indications it was just much improved, and so I think the usability of it in the end really drove the better uptake. Okay, uh, let's move on then to the last uh, scheduled speaker. Uh, Lyric Johnson Jorgensen is here from uh, the Office of Science Policy at the NIH, uh, where she's deputy director. Um, she's been one of the leading uh, uh, proponents and, and uh, movers of the of showcase NIH programs uh, to to deliver. Uh, clinical uh, clinical treatments to um, to uh, patients. Um, she was instrumental and still is, I guess, in following up uh, the uh, uh, moonshot project that was proposed and is underway. Uh, the proposal from Vice President Biden, um, and uh, she's going to describe to us, I hope, the uh, the current level of of uh, commitment by the NIH uh, and the new administration uh, to these uh, important clinical delivery uh, efforts, um, which uh, are obviously undergoing uh, rapid and, and uh, unpredictable changes, uh, but she's going to bring us up to date on where she see, sees federal support and NIH specifically 
going in these areas uh, to make to make promise of uh, the technological developments a reality for patients. So that will do so all in under 30. 20 minutes. Um, all in 20 minutes. <laughs> Um, thank you for that introduction. As mentioned, I'm currently in the Office of Science Policy at the National Institutes of Health. However, last year I was on loan to Vice President Biden as his Deputy Executive Director for the Cancer Moonshot. So today I'll talk to you a little bit about the impetus for that project, what we did over the course of the year, and then I'll pivot into kind of NIH's forecasting for the project um, for the next coming foreseeable future. Is this one? How did you advance? Not smarter. Okay, sorry. That does not go for my 20 minute total. Um, so, as many of you probably know, um, the President Obama and Vice President Joe Biden launched the moonshot last year at the end of January, early February. And they stated the goal, putting Vice President Biden in charge, that the moonshot was to dramatically accelerate efforts to prevent, diagnose, and treat cancer to achieve a decade's worth of progress in simply five years. And that's a pretty broad mission for a project, everything from advancing research um, to changing the way we deliver health care and really improving patient outcomes. But the charge was really so broad because the vice president, through his experience, I think really saw the opportunity to make a change in how we do this kind of work. So as many of you know in this room, the science has been really poised for dramatic acceleration. However, we have some interesting incentive structures and barriers that as an ecosystem, I think um, he really felt that a focused and coordinated effort would be positioned to address. And so that's what I'm going to talk about a lot for today. So not probably surprising to many in this room, part of the impetus for the moonshot obviously was the impressive scientific breakthroughs that are currently in our midst. So obviously our new scientific understanding, things like immunotherapy and all the work that you guys are discussing here today is really propelling at a rapid pace. We also have new powerful technologies like CRISPR, which seems to be in almost every single session, and all of these other kind of um, technologies that are driving the edge of science forward. And then finally, we have all of this um, um, access to data. And this can be whether it's scientific data, access to electronic health records, or even things from Fitbit or lifestyle choices, et cetera. All of this is out there in some form. And I think that you know, if we work together to figure out ways to combine this data and make useful sense of patterns, et cetera, we can really drive forward progress. So this was some of the impetus for why it felt like now is a really the right time to launch a new effort into cancer. I know all of you know we had the war on cancer before, but this is um, a unique history or a unique period of time in history where science was really positioning us to move forward. That um, coupled with the global commitment to the accelerating uh, progress in cancer. So this is a picture at the vice president at the UN General Assembly last year, and you can see world leaders all around the table. I think at that meeting he broke over 10 deals across the, the globe for people to say we'll share data, we'll share resources, we'll work together because this is such an important, prog uh, important thing for us to work on together. So once the moonshot was launched, um, the vice president immediately convened a task force. Um, which is a very governmental thing to do, but in this case it was really fascinating in that he brought together over 20 agencies, offices, and departments. And this was the usual players like National Institutes of Health, Health and Human Services, FDA, CDC, et cetera. But you also had people that you might not think would be at the table, like the Department of Energy, or the National Endowment of the Arts, or NASA. All of these people, had, or their agencies, had a role to play in the fight against cancer. And so we wanted to bring them all to the table so we could come up with new and innovative solutions to some of the barriers that had been um, put forth. This group ultimately was charged with lever leveraging federal investments, target incentives, private sector efforts, patient engagement efforts, and more to accelerate progress in cancer care and treatment. Um, they also, they convened regularly, but also worked with the private sector to figure out where there were places we could partner to make more change. So the implementation um, path 
that was set forth by that group was um, depicted in this diagram. You can see government at top, but you have research institutions, the private sector, and importantly, healthcare providers all working together to address things about how we communicate together, how we approach innovation, how we collaborate, and very importantly, how we disseminate information. This was a key part where it couldn't just be in that circle, but that information, as Margaret was talking about, needed to be open sourced so that anything we did, people could learn from and benefit so we could catalyze success faster. And you'll see at the center of it all, um, patients. One of the things about the cancer moonshot was really thinking um, about, again, how to focus on what patients need and what they're asking for. I think Margaret touched upon this really nicely that we talk about patients a lot, but exactly what is it that would benefit them most and how can we work with them to make sure that whatever we deliver is actually what's needed to improve their lives. From this process, the working group came up with five strategic goals. And this is the, the kind of the ways they decided to tackle the barriers that were impeding progress in cancer research and care. So the first goal was to catalyze new scientific breakthroughs. Let's think about how we can continue to push the envelope in science. What are the next bound breakthroughs that we need to make? The second one was to unleash the power of data. This is that broad category of data, everything from how we analyze data to interpret data to share data can be raw data, it can be clinical trial data, or even access to publications. How are you all getting access to the information you need in real time so that you're not wasting your time or that you're building on the successes of others? The third goal was accelerate bringing new therapies to patients. This really focused a lot, I think, on some of what the FDA does. How can we design innovative clinical trials? How can we address those questions about the cystic fibrosis patients who only have an N of one? What are the trials that are appropriate to make sure that we don't leave them out of the drug development process? Fourth was to strengthen prevention and diagnosis. I think a lot of you are also fully aware that we have learned a tremendous amount about the causes of cancer. We understand that it's a series of genomic issues. Um, we also understand the role of tobacco, lifestyle, and other choices. And so we really need to make sure that we prevent the disease when we can with things like effective vaccines or get the diagnosis early so that we can prevent it before it progresses to the stage of terminal. And then finally, but not lastly, as improve patient access and care. All of the best treatments, cures, diagnostics, et cetera, don't mean anything if people don't have access to them. What are the impediments to getting these treatments into the communities? Um, I believe 80% of cancer patients actually seek their care, care in community hospitals. How do we make sure that all the best, latest and greatest are not tied up in academic health centers, but find their ways to the populations that need them? So these are the five goals um, that, the working, that the task force focused on. All of them are interrelated and all kind of form the ecosystem for their activities moving forward. So under this rubric, the Cancer ta uh, Moonshot Task Force in June launched its first summit. This was um, what was called a National Day of Action. It was hosted by the Vice President at Howard University but it also spurred roughly 270 events across the country. So summits, I think actually we made it in all 50 states, Puerto Rico um, and a few of the other territories all held one. This is a day where everyone came together and made a commitment to do something, whether it's drive people to their cancer care communities, NIH launched a new partnership for, um, with pharmaceutical companies at any level, what people were doing to commit to making um, a commitment to the moonshot. So some of these, uh, there are 40 commitments that were announced that day. I'll just talk about a few of them briefly. So the first was um, investing in research. The American Cancer Society decided to double down on their investment and made a public commitment to double their budget for um, their organization. NIH, I think I alluded to this a second ago, NIH um, launched a new pre-competitive industry collaboration. It's called the PAC Partnership with roughly 10 to 12 pharmaceutical companies where they made a commitment to work together to find, um, I think mostly in immunotherapy, to spur some research and share that data in real time with the community and then um, take the most promising pathways on to uh, clinical trials. Another partnership was between the Department of Energy and the Department of Veteran Affairs. They um, basically took the amazing computing power of the Department of Energy, which is some of the best in the world, and uh, employed it within the Department of Veteran Affairs to find new patterns in that uh, rich and vast amount of treasure of data that is 
within the Million Veterans Program. Uh, the next partnership was between the National Cancer Institute and the Genomic Data Commons. This one was really about facilitating the public's access to data, especially um, researchers' access to raw genomic data and all of the, uh, the analysis patterns that are used to make um, all the publications that come out. And then the final one that I was just going to highlight was that IBM partnered with the Department of Veteran Affairs to loan their tool Watson to help them make uh, sense of some of that information, working in tandem with the doctors at the VA to make better care and treatment decisions. So that's just an example of the spattering of commitments that were announced at the June partnership or the June meeting. After that um, meeting, we had a, a lot of work left to do, a lot of more partnerships trying to really spur this movement in the community, um, resulting in a roadmap that was presented by the vice president to the president um, later that year. And this was, had three components. One was the vice president's personal vision for igniting innovation within the biomedical research enterprise. And this was his, um, his views on the systematic barriers to what is impeding cancer progress and care. And these are things like how we collaborate, how we share information, how drug prices are affecting the reaching of care to um, communities. And so this is a, a really bold vision of what needs to be tackled and the incentive structures that need to be changed so that we can really make progress. The second component of that roadmap was um, the federal government's plan for continuing the moonshot. So in that roadmap, they've included what they did in year one. I talked about a few of those partnerships, but they also laid out what they would do in year two and beyond, provided um, funding and support for moving forward for the moonshot. So I encourage you to read that document to see where they were beheaded in terms of continuing the movement for the moonshot. And then the final part of the roadmap was a scientific roadmap that was identifying areas poised for acceleration. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that because that's kind of in my current hat now, now that I'm back at NIH. So that during the moonshot's time, the NIH convened a blue ribbon panel. Um, they consulted with more than 100 experts around the country to really identify major scientific opportunities that were on the cusp of being ready to accelerate um, progress in cancer. So I'm not going to read all of these recommendations to you. You will see them below. But they, this group um, pulled this, this roadmap together for NIH funding. Fortunately for um, the NIH, uh, in December, the Can um, 21st Century Cures Act was passed. And I believe Margaret talked about that earlier with the 21st Century Cures Act, uh, Act tracker. In this uh, legislation, um, Congress very, was very favorable of the moonshot and um, named it the Bo Biden Cancer Moonshot Initiative and um, gave $1.8 billion over seven years beginning with $300 million in fiscal year 17. And under that act, this money is to support cancer research, such as the development of cancer vaccines, the development of more sensitive diagnostic tests for cancer immunotherapy, and the development of combination therapies, research that has the potential to transform the scientific field that has inherently higher risk and that seeks to address major challenges associated with cancer. So this is an important aspect because, as you know, NIH has the National Cancer Institute, which is devoted to all of the issues facing cancer research and care. But this is supposed to be the bold and exciting ideas that will really push the field forward. So just to give you guys a quick overview of what the funding for the moonshot at the NIH looks like, um, $1.8 billion over seven years. It is not a stable trajectory of funding due to budget issues and offsetting um, issues that can't really go into in 20 minutes. Um, but you will see that in fiscal year 17 and 18, uh, it's proposed of 300 million, and then 400 million in 19, and then there's a bit of a decline in 2020 and beyond. But this is the current tracking for what um, the moonshot funds look like for NIH, provided that appropriations continue. We were lucky um, in fiscal year 17, we do have our 300 million, and so we are moving on moving full steam ahead. We have RFAs on the street and hope to be making our first funding awards in the coming future. So what I want to close with is, is what's next for the moonshot. Um, there's always a lot of questions about what happens to it. The task force is not convening still at the White House. However, um, the federal government has its roadmap in hand and people are making progress on their commitments. 
People in the private sector have been mobilized by the energy of the moonshot and have been working hard. There will be another summit this coming summer where the cancer community will come together and hold themselves accountable of what they've been working on. Um, and importantly, the vice president has started a new foundation. There are several pillars of this foundation, but one of which is to continue championing the causes under the moonshot. And he's really interested in tackling those big issues. You can see on the, on the chart things like um, how we can change the culture around data sharing and foster data sharing and what does that mean and what is the right level and how do we make researchers spend more time doing research and less time writing grants and all of these kind of things that we've found to be um, challenges within the research ecosystem. So I expect we will continue to see big and brilliant things from him as it helm, uh, at the helm and um, I look forward to seeing what comes next. Thank you very much, Larry. Uh, so let me uh, uh, hand it over to Tim Hunt, and he can uh, get the panel discussion underway. Great. Th thanks very much, Ted, and thank you, Margaret, Martin, and Larry, very much. Um, let me start off with a question, then if people have questions, they can begin to queue up in the microphone, but uh, I'll jump in with the first one. Um, actually, when Ted and I spoke uh, some weeks ago, um, I was describing to him um, an initiative we did as ASGCT to do some basic education on Capitol Hill, uh, in particular with the Senate Health Committee on a bipartisan basis around gene editing, sort of a primer on gene editing. And um, Ted said, geez, you know, uh, about 30 years ago I, I worked with this group, uh, the Office of Technology Assessment, and we did the similar kind of thing on gene therapy. And we were both sort of laughing, talking about the importance of basic education on a bipartisan basis to help build the sustainability of biomedical research and innovation. Um, I also noticed that someone on this panel had worked at the Office of Technology Assessment once upon a time, Margaret. Um, you did make uh, a few comments. I guess m my question about that, my, my question would be, um, could you give us some thoughts on, uh, all three of you, on the importance of multi-stakeholder engagement as it relates to policy leaders on a bipartisan basis for that long-term sustainable effort. I know um, selfishly about gene editing, we think of it as NIH funding really in, out of the 80s began both the kind of twin engine of doing uh, research on bacterial systems and viruses, which led to CRISPR technology, as well as in parallel early funding, I think in 1989, for the Human Genome Project and how Gene editing is piggybacked on that success. That's a thread that's pulled through now for decades. If you think of eventually, hopefully, a CRISPR medicine being approved for a patient, um, which is a point we made to the Senate Health Committee staff, frankly, uh, the real criticality of NIH funding. We'll come back to that in a minute. But any thoughts on uh, that important multi stakeholder and bipartisan engagement from all three? So I'll start. I am. Um... I worked at that congressional agency, OTA. It was the first place I went uh, out of graduate school. And, it, you know, it was an extraordinary opportunity to watch the sausage making of science policy at a time in history that was probably a little less fraught than it is now. Um, and it was put out of business, you know, by Congress. Uh, they, they needed to show that they meant business about cutting their own budget. And so they, it was kind of a susceptible agency and off it went. Because uh, really there were only about 200 staff there and they used an advisory panel model and they would create the report usually, you know, a year to 18 months and then they'd have a, a congressional issues and options chapter. I think the, the value add of what they provided was they would bring in the experts, the scientific community, the stakeholders around a particular issue and they would very uh, methodically work through the, you know, the process of trying to teach Congress about that issue. What you described in terms of your work with the HELP Committee, it's just, it's the same thing, it's just condensed. And so, you know, we don't have an agency like OTA, but we do have the opportunity to continue that kind of science education. I talked about some of the optimism about 21st century cures, and I, I do think that we have some really rock solid champions on Capitol Hill. I mean, they just provided an additional two billion for the NIH uh, in their most recent budget. So 
I think the thing that I would kind of give to all of you, though, is remember that some people stop taking science in high school, and not everybody feels comfortable about what they know and what they don't know. So you really need to think about how you're doing your education. If it gets too technical, too wonky, if people feel uh, I'm not smart enough to understand what they're talking about, you know, then they can turn off. So I think there's really interesting and exciting ways to bring people into science. And if anybody participated in the Science March uh, recently, you know, I know it happened all over the country. I went to the one in DC. A lot of young people, I mean, my daughter went, and I think she's finally gotten to the place of understanding that I'm not trying to shoehorn her into a scientist if that's not her calling, but I said to her, you need to understand and respect and, and honor science the same way that we want, you know, the same for the arts, um, maybe democracy. I mean, you, you fill in the blank. But, I, you know, I think that there are great opportunities to do that kind of education and to tell the story in a really fun, interesting way about what's possible. And, you know, I threw up the you know, the thing in my times are changing about the Guardians of the Galaxy. I mean, most of that probably is fanciful, but think about science fiction as a genre, whether it's film or, or um, reading, and, you know, some of it is, is real. Now, you guys as the Ethics Committee, you have to talk about, you know, sort of how do we want to approach some, you know, this from a societal standpoint. I'll finish by saying, you know, Lyric's boss, Dr. Collins, is probably one of the most profound science communicators maybe that we've ever seen. And his ability to be excited about the promise of science and the institution of the NIH and what it represents and how it works, um, that's an asset that I, I just don't think that we can underestimate. So we're strong proponents, my organization, of making him permanent for the NIH director, as he has been before. From the CF Foundation's point of view, I mean, you can only say that we have recognized advocacy on many levels that's very important to engage with many stakeholders. I mean, I alluded to that we have interaction with the FDA regularly, but we have also a Teen Advocacy Day on Capitol Hill every year where actually we specifically do not try to come with the top heavy science to the politicians, but it's more siblings uh, that grow up with other, uh, with their siblings with CF, so they just, it's more on a compassionate level. They deliver sort of the stories of growing up, and I mean that's definitely something that resonates very well. There is, as a result of all these efforts, a national caucus of CS that's headed by Senator Ed Markey from Massachusetts, and these uh, advocacy events are also happening um, in many states. So Massachusetts, I've been a number of times to the state house for that. So. I think it's very important that we really work on many levels with many stakeholders, also payers. I mean, the foundation regularly interacts with payers because the treatments that are approved are, of course, very expensive. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I can only say we have fully embraced the, the idea that it's important to interact with all stakeholders. Thank you. And Lyric, um, I don't know if you'd care to add anything. I mean, you guys really were a model, um, I think, for many of us watching the Cancer Moonshot Initiative, and you've seen it from both inside the White House and at the NIH, so I don't want to put you on the hook, but any, any thoughts, any advice you'd share with all of us as ASGCT or? I'm having such technical difficulties today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm having technical difficulties today. Um, yeah, so the Cancer Moonshot was really exciting, I think, because one, we all understood the value of cancer. I mean, most of us have been touched by cancer in some way. I mean, I was thinking this the other day, um, we had roofers at our house and who were spent an exorbitant amount of time explaining to me all of the pieces of my roof. I, I don't need them to. I know the value of my roof and I, I need a roof, right? So cancer is kind of the same way and I think when we're communicating to people, we need to communicate the value of what it is why it's valuable to them, why they should care about it, not necessarily all of the minutia of what's happening, but what the, what the end goal is and how it'll be effective for them. Um, I think, you know, the, the vice president was extremely skilled in this. He would make sure that he spoke at the level of the room at all times. Um, and I, I can tell you as, as a person who helped write some of those talking points, it would always be, no, that's too technical, that's too jargony, no one knows what you're talking about. Um, and so I think that that's important for us to think about when we're communicating to people. Um, I don't understand roofing terminology. 
other people don't understand CRISPR-Cas. We need to come together at a level that people can understand what we're saying to each other because we all have different expertise. Ted, anything you no. want to, yeah, you, you've, uh, you've been at this for a little while. Why don't you give us some <laughs> well, thoughts? Well, let, let me, at the risk of being a little provocative, I'm sorry, but uh, uh, particularly, Margaret, uh, I'd like your opinion on whether you think that, that, um, uh, that the mechanism that was developed around OTA was particularly useful as an institutional conduit for information to policymakers, uh, and whether you think we have, uh, we have anything that's that effective now, or that the um, faster cures people can agitate for and advocate for. I think that my position would be we don't have anything like that now. Um, some years ago, I, I published a little thing called "We Can't Expect uh, Enlightened Policy from Unenlightened Policymakers" or something, and, and we are not feeding science to policymakers who go off and make policy and make law that sometimes might not be as enlightened as it could be. So where is your organization in advocating for something like an OTA? It doesn't need to be exactly the same, but I think that we desperately miss OTA. This OTA, uh, and there used to be an ex OTA listserv that would circulate, you know, chatter about what you're talking about. Kind of, can it be resuscitated? I actually don't think it can be at this point. It's not, that is a different answer than should we have one and would it be useful? I think it would be very useful and I think we should have one. I, you know, as I talked about things like Snapchat, I think the all of our uh, attention span has gotten severely diminished for how we absorb information. So that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do something in a thorough way, but I do think you have to kind of evolve with the marketplace. But, you know, let me talk about another opportunity for advocacy, which is we're part of a group called the Alliance for a Stronger FDA. And this coalition has been around, uh, you know, close to a decade. And it is an a coalition expressly for the purpose of advocating for appropriations for the FDA. So we don't touch user fees, we don't get into policy about you know, anything that they're doing. It's just saying this is a strong agency that needs money and it needs federal money. So don't let user fees pay for the whole thing. And when we go on Capitol Hill with that group, we specifically create teams that are multi-stakeholders. So we'll have an industry person next to a patient person next to a um, consumer product person next to a veterinary medicine. I mean, it's really the gamut of what the FDA kind of is involved in and touches. Maybe an academic scientist, you know, who has lots of spin outs. And, you know, that has been a very effective way for us on Capitol Hill to capture the attention of the Hill staff who say, wow, you guys are, you know, I don't think you would agree on everything, but you seem to be pretty um, much in agreement about this idea that we need more money for the agency. So I, I think it, that's an important thing to remember, that they, they need to hear about what you're doing, but if you all are engaged with patient communities, you know, everybody always says, bring a patient along and they're gonna pay attention a little bit differently. So I believe in the power of kind of the diversity of, of opinion and stakeholders when you're doing this kind of education. This, the longer term issue though of what an OTA provided, the very thoughtful analysis of these issues, I just think it's going to have to be picked up along the way by other entities. The difference back then was that Congress, it was a congressional agency and Congress would ask for the study. So, you know, Congress right now has a, an approval rating of what, 9% or something? It's, it's pretty low. So they, they're, I just think it's a whole different body than it was back then. There's, there's a different pace, there are different imperatives. Um, so I guess I'm not a big advocate that I think the model would fit today. I think it fit beautifully for back then, and I was proud. I was part of the biological applications program. We worked on, you know, a series on commercial investment in biotechnology at the beginning. Uh, you know, we did lots of things on bioethics. Uh, I led a study on cystic fibrosis carrier screening. We looked at genetic testing in the workplace. The most interesting from the staff perspective, we led a um, study on DNA fingerprinting and forensic uses at the beginning of that with, you know, looking at the FBI and, you know, trying to understand what were the databases and how is this gonna be deployed. So, uh, you know, that, maybe I'm talking myself back into it, but I think these, <laughs> These issues are important, they're thorny. 
I know the National Academies, you know, plays some of that role, but they have to go and sing for their supper a little bit and get resources to do the work that they're doing. So it's but not it's an easy let's answer. Let's aside there. Let me, uh, let's go to the, to Cindy for first question from the So, crowd. you know, I think a lot of what's been percolating around at the meeting and at the, you know, when the society of leadership is talking is this whole issue of how you sort of um, conceptualize value especially of the concept of cure or a very long-term benefit from often, you know, therapies that we're designing that are, you know, extremely complicated and obviously very expensive and don't fit well into the, you know, current reimbursement system, probably anywhere in the world, but certainly not here with the, the way our system works. So, you know, how do you think we as a society or, you know, anybody who's interested in, you know, improving cancer treatments long-term like here or, you know, severe, serious genetic disease like cystic fibrosis or getting any of these therapies to patients quickly, how would you sort of think about approaching that, you know, in a sort of way that brings in patient advocates and foundations and societies like ours? I know it's a huge question and you can't probably solve the society and all of our members, you know, issues on this <laughs> particular topic at once, but I think it's sort of the major question that many of us have as we finally start to have evidence that some of these therapies could actually work and are working in patients and sort of how do we get policymakers and, and the public to understand that this is a way that in the long term might be a benefit to society and may even in the long term be cheaper. That's definitely a big question. Um, I mean, I, I just maybe pick up one, one piece sort of on the cost of cures. I mean, where CF has definitely been in the press, and I would say even our own community is divided on how justified the high cost currently is, how detrimental versus how beneficial it is. Obviously, we're developing uh, treatments for a small numbers, so that they must be more expensive than a, uh, you know, than a Lipitor or something. But, uh, um, I think we are right now, the foundation is kind of trying to stay out of the political side, side of things. I think we, we have said certainly you know, on occasion we wish for cheaper treatment, but we also realize that right now it has to be as expensive as it is to, to, to get started and with a greater uptake and over time and hopefully uh, upcoming competition will sort of help to, help to bring things down and so these are all aspects that internally we are certainly working on. And yeah, I, th I think that's sort of what I can probably from my end to say to that. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, you have to. Yes, sorry. <laughs> I mean, I think this is something at NIH we especially think about a lot. I mean, uh, for us, you know, we invest a lot in basic research and want that research to move into the private sector. So how, at the end of the day, do we take credit for all of the money taxpayers put into the agency? And I think, as, as Margaret mentioned, you know, Dr. Collins is, is really good at this, but part of it is, is telling the story. I mean, if you look at look at like AIDS. AIDS was once a death sentence and now it's a manage, manageable chronic disease. Um, and some of the, the story that we have to tell is how innovation is going to ultimately be what brings down costs. Investing in innovation, if you think about how expensive it was to sequence the genome in the beginning versus now, and it'll continue to be cheaper. And so I think to some extent, um, combating the problem is continuing to tell the story and the value about how the investment ultimately will bring down costs and ultimately will make the difference. But it's, it's, a, it's a continued bang the drum, steady beat. I would, uh, you know, I, th I think for you all as an organization, as much as you can get ahead of the curve and figure out some use cases of, you know, even create hypothetical cures and understand, you know, hire out if you need to get the expertise and figure out, well, what happens when that cure, you know, drops in on the system. The system has not, I think, known what to do with cures. So we have, you know, the example of Harvoni and, you know, there was a lot of consternation about that. I just was in a conference and I heard a talk about how, um, you know, there's still a significant number of patients who are not getting access to that therapy. They're being, they're having to go into liver failure to actually be able to take Harvoni, you know, if they're on a particular you know, payment like state Medicaid in California or they're in a prison population. So 
We've been doing work at Faster Cures looking at the patient perspective in the value discussion, and we've worked with a company called Avalier, and we've created a framework that's going to be released on Thursday. We're going to keep doing that work. There are these existing value frameworks that have gotten a lot of traction um, you know, it, by the payer community. And there's one in particular called ICER, um, and I don't know exactly what ICER stands for, but if you Google ICER and, and value, it'll come up. And we've done a lot of work with them, as have a number of other groups, to try to kind of bridge this divide, because it seemed like the, the client, so to speak, was the insurance industry, the payers, instead of you know, kind of looking at the whole ecosystem of the innovation, who's providing the innovation, and then what do patients want and need. And, and they just did uh, a report on psoriasis therapies, that they worked with one of the psoriasis disease organizations, and I think that they all felt pretty good about that process. But it wasn't particularly enjoyable at the beginning. Faster Cures takes money from pharmaceutical companies, and that it wasn't, we didn't feel targeted in the equation, but I participated in a meeting where somebody looked at me and said, well, basically, you're conflicted, and what do you have to offer because you take money from pharma? You know, and so that, the transparency around who, who's getting money from whom and how does that influence them, and you know, that has been a, uh, an evolving discussion, at least in the patient advocacy community. You know, when we comment on federal uh, regulations, so we just did a comment letter a few months back on something that CMS had, and I had people coming up to me saying, who wrote your letter? And I said, what do you mean, who wrote my letter? You know, my staff member two doors down wrote the letter. Well, who paid you for that position? I said, nobody paid us for that position. So we started putting lines into our letter saying, you know, this position was created by Faster Cures full-time staff members. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of suspicion, you know, back to the times they were changing around motivation for, you know, wh why do you have that opinion and where's the money going? And I think the fact that we can't get behind the curtain on drug pricing and really understand, because I don't think it's a clear dotted line of how a price point is developed, it has created, I think, you know, all of the, the, the consternation that you're witnessing out in the press. And, you know, President Trump has said, I'm going to do something on drug pricing. I don't think anybody has any understanding of what specifically that will be, what mechanism, what they're gonna look at. Um, but I do think that that, that what you brought up in terms of how your sector can start to get ahead of the curve, uh, it is very important because I think the cure for hep C, I'm not privy to all of the education that went on, but it did feel like it kind of parachuted in, and I, and, you know, I think the health system reacted very strongly. So. It's interesting, in a, in a previous life, I, um, I worked for a, a company that became the largest um, firm doing antibiotic R&D for superbugs. And it was a small company based in Lexington, and we were spending about $300 million a year, $400 million a year on research and development. And the biggest problem was we'd walk around and talk to people on Capitol Hill and others and say, biggest problem is we're the biggest company in the world doing antibiotic R&D, and we're spending $300 or $400 million a year. And it, there was a supplier problem. So it had been, it had been, the word had gotten out, it's a bad market. And when you actually unpack it, and talk to highly innovative biotech companies like we're not going anywhere near because the reimbursement is terrible under a DRG in the hospital. And so that's a exhibit A. We would we finally were like, this is exhibit A. When you get reimbursement wrong, reasonable suppliers bolt the market and you're left with a superbugs crisis, which is really a tragedy. Tragedy. Um, I think we have time for one more. Question? Yeah? I actually have two questions. The first one is you talk a lot about collaboration, open source, and then you go to the next lecture and it will be about patent and protecting your research. So how does that work between the industry and all you're doing? And my second question is actually going back to the previous one as a European, um, we feel, I feel like you talk about all the barriers, but I feel like in America, the main barrier is access. There is you don't have universal health care. So even if you develop all those beautiful therapies, it feels like it will never get to all the patients. So shouldn't you include this in all your <laughs> presentations? Thank you. Any takers? <laughs> I mean, I, I'm going to ask you to yeah. comment on it. 
just because I think the whole model of the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation has been around attacking those, the, the first set of barriers, the research barriers, to try to, you guys are the, you know, the grand aggregator of all of the knowledge and the, you know, kind of pushing it forward. And that's the model that a lot of the disease foundations have served. Um, you know, it hasn't, I think, from our standpoint at the 30,000 foot level, it hasn't always been probably the most happy relationship because a lot of the not-for-profits have said, you know, I can't deal with some of these, you know, IP restrictions. We're going to go to a CRO and deal with, get some of the scientific information we need. And, you know, so I, I think that there has been change and there's been a little bit more openness, but it's, I don't think it's always been an easy relationship for the university, traditional university academic science community to relate to some of the not-for-profits. I'm not speaking on behalf of CF for that one, but. Well, I mean, CF is certainly in the boat with everybody else. Uh, um, I mean, we have certainly funded, I mean, as I said earlier, we fund a lot of basic research, which I think, you know, the, most of the researchers involved with that, they live by publications. Um, so we fully encouraging, and that's of course one way of sharing it. Um, it gets a little bit trickier when academic uh, researchers get involved in drug discovery. They s discover small molecules. We had certainly cases where those molecules were published quickly before anybody, you know, could IP protect them, and so they would not be of commercial value afterwards anymore. Um, I think it is somewhat complicated, but. Uh, and I mean, just looking at Lyric's uh, presentation, there's even now big farmers that sort of share tools, but I think most of that sharing is really on the pre-clinical development, so on the early research. Um, and then, so the proprietary aspect comes really in where the big money is spent, which is the clinical development, really. And uh, um, so I think it's not completely contradicting uh, each other that you share early, but uh, then you still have sort of proprietary products coming out of it. And, you know, if multiple parties at the end feel enabled to develop a proprietary product, I mean, that probably also helps everybody if we have more than, more than one outcome and maybe it makes it a little bit cheaper too than rather than what's just one going forward. And I guess your other question about access, I mean, the CF Foundation is certainly very working very hard on keeping everything accessible. I mean, we had somewhat lengthy fights with Medicaid in Arkansas, for example, to get uh, patients on Kaleidico, but usually at the end we have managed to accomplish that. I mean, Vertex and I think other companies that have these really expensive uh, treatments on the market also have a patient assistance program, so in the US, Vertex is willing to pay up to 35% of the drug price, reimburse patients if that's a co-pay of theirs. I mean, you know, that's can be up to $100,000 at out of pocket that Vertex would be willing to, to reimburse. I mean, the European market, so I grew up in Germany myself, works very differently. But, you know, also not every country there is equal, right? I mean, um, so I think the US certainly has an access problem, but I also think like the organizations like ours and others are all working hard to sort of at the end get the drug to the patient. You know, I don't know if you want to add anything. I think one watch, though, I would, oh, sorry, Ted, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, one watch I would, I would throw out is, um, you know, if you go through the journey of the 10-year, 15-year journey, you raise a billion dollars or $2 billion, you get a drug onto the market. One of the things we're starting to see now is, um, I was over in Brussels in February for a Eurotis meeting, which is sort of a Nord of Europe, and it was a multi-stakeholder meeting with a lot of health technology assessors. And they did a case study on BioMarin's product for lysosomal storage disorders that had just recently been approved in um, Vimizin, I think, or something like that. And, um, and they worked out, they did a case study, and they worked out with the National Health Service and the lo local patient advocacy group in the UK a managed access plan after they had figured out reimbursement. And it was a model in some ways and very troubling in others because it subjected each patient, including patients who'd been on the product through the clinical trials, to four um, physical examinations in a year and seven phone calls. And if they weren't making progress, they're off the drug. Yeah. So you had patients saying, I'm, I'm really afraid that I've been on this drug for three years and I'm going to get pulled off the drug. And I think that, that is a change and a challenge that's probably kind of making its way across Western Europe and maybe towards the United States as well. And I think no one has the 
perfect answer, um, but it's a, it's a thing we all probably have to watch and think about. I, I think that's true, but you know, I mean, another side of this is, in, at least in the U.S. market, I think we got a long way to go to connect the dots between the provider community and the health systems and the deployment of care. I mean, if you have cystic fibrosis, you can get into you know kind of a clinical care network and and probably you know, receive state-of-the-art care, and it's probably the care model is evolving, you know, rapidly. Um, you know, everybody talks about pediatric oncology, and that I remember talking to a um, clinician scientist a couple years back who said, you know, if there's a child diagnosed with cancer, it's, you know, there's this sort of universal imperative, get that child to mm -hmm. a clinical network, get that child into a clinical trial if there's not a, you know, really strong standard of care, which we don't certainly have for adults. Um, but, you know, you still hear stories of women being diagnosed or being, um, you know, given Herceptin that are not tested to see if they would actually benefit from that, yet the system is paying for it and women are taking things that are not going to help them. So I think there's, that's going to be another part of, you know, once we're through whatever the chapter looks like in the U.S. with, uh, you know, the next iteration of health care reform, I would like to see a little bit more of a coming together around how care is deployed and you know, bringing in this innovation notion of how do we make sure we get state-of-the-art care. I mean, I think it's, you know, if you, I'm sure you guys looked at it in the cancer community, but I still talk to people, and I'm sure many of you do too, right? So they get diagnosed with something that's not great in the cancer area, and you think, why are you going to your little local hospital? You need to be seeing a state-of-the-art, you know, Johns Hopkins style place. You're in Virginia. What are you doing? You know, and oh, I, you know, it's convenient. My wife can drive me over there. No, no, no. You have pancreatic cancer. You need to be in a certain type of place. And I just think I think it goes back to what you were talking about with science literacy, health literacy. You know, how to how do members of Congress um, absorb information? Some of the things that you guys are you know hoping to see in terms of the science that you're incenting. It, you know, I. I there will be a Time Magazine cover, and you know the average person has to kind of parse through that and figure out what do they do with it. So I think collectively we all have a lot of work to do in that space that goes beyond the pricing and, and all of that. I mean, this this was really a struggle during the the moonshot because you you did get that oh my gosh why are you not going to Center X or Center Y etc. and and patients were saying because my family is here because my kids are in school I can't do that. Um, I, I mean, being in a clinical trial is a real impediment for a lot of people and, and, and those things. And so one of the things that we spent a lot of time was trying to figure out how to create partnerships between community centers and academic hospitals and others and, and sharing kind of the best practices and models for telehealth, that, you know, those kind of things to make sure that everything that was happening across the country was shared um, equally within all of, all of the centers. And of course, that's a, that's a big, tall ask, and it's not just cancer. But um, I think, to, to your point, that's, that's really something that we have to work on. Just to add briefly on that, you said that CF patients can basically be seen in CF care centers, but we certainly had the development that some payers were looking to f not pay for the more expensive care, CF specialized care centers, but rather just want patients to be seen by their you know, local doctor um, without this uh, specific CF expertise. And that's something which we are also really working hard on and finding that this doesn't become a trend to something because I mean, we spend a lot of money and effort in improving CF care all the time and you know keeping basically the centers current, this sort of quality of care assessments every year. And so if patients are forced out of that system, that would be very detrimental for the, the whole uh, disease progress. And, uh, I mean, the, we had a question about a single payer system. So my, I get my care through Kaiser Permanente. So I'm in a, you know, kind of an, an enclosed system where, uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion about the art and the science of medicine. And I think that, you know, we're entering this age where uh, I don't know what the average number of papers would be that a physician would have to read to be up on the literature, but it's some exponential number. It's impossible. So a system like Kaiser, you know, their business model basically is to crunch that data and create, you know, care standards uh, and, you know, be able to have their physicians deploy based on that and be evaluated based on that because they're paid a salary. So, uh, you know, I have no idea how they fare with a cystic fibrosis patient, but um, I do think that we are in this funky transformative part of the healthcare journey where, you know, the average Joe out there is having to kind of be their own navigator of all of this. 
Uh, and it's, it's a lot to put on people, I think. I have a question which is kind of perfectly fits what you just said about the management of healthcare in a, um, using the HMO, HMO style like Kaiser Permanente. And um, the question that I have uh, for, for you is if we look at the, any given rare disease or rare disorder from a business uh, perspective, there are at least two fundamental characteristics um, about it. One is the cost, how much does it cost to take care and deliver quality um, service? And the second thing is how do we define uh, quality service? Um, so the second characteristic, which is really uh, clinical scales and uh, just different ways to measure the quality of taking care of certain diseases, probably science and translation medicine and physici physicians. But the first one is how much does it cost? Is a very hard thing to uh, answer, uh, you know, sitting in the medical office. Uh, so for our you know, diseases, um, organic acidemias that our group is studying, it's very hard to understand how much does it take care per patient per year on average to take care of a person with any given diagnosis. It's a colossal task to get that data and it's usually incomplete if, if we want to use publicly available Medicaid, Medicaid, uh, Medicare data, because there's Blue Cross Blue Shield, KP, all sorts of uh, providers. It almost makes sense that if we were to do it, just do it once, and for all diseases, um, to get this type of information, where is this type of project on your radar? And are you aware of anybody who is actually trying to uh, get metrics uh, to uh, uh, governments? and um, investigators. I'm, I am not aware of anyone doing anything on the scale that you're talking about. Yeah, neither am I. I mean, I can, you were asking, how do you develop metrics to assess care? I mean, there, with the patient registry that we have in hand, we can certainly see how patients are doing seen in a different center. So I mean, let's say, for example, if at a treatment center in San Francisco, just as an example, we have many fewer hospitalizations, fewer patients heading for lung transplants, um, and altogether, let's say, having more stable lung function over years because all this is tracked. I mean, one can then go into the center, and one sees other centers which are not achieving the same levels. Um, then one can basically go in and see what are you doing differently and trying to sort of bring basically the treatment approach that is at the well-performing centers to bring it to other centers. But, I mean, that's, again, as I said earlier, it's not something one builds overnight. I mean, this is a system, uh, so these metrics that need to be measured really take time to develop and, and to mature also that before you can trust actually the readouts. Um, but I think that is sort of on the care quality, it can be done, and there's enough papers written up about that. I think also in other disease areas, not just CF. Uh, I think the value that was your first part of the question, uh, that's how much does it have to cost? I mean, that's a more difficult question, right? I mean, I think you can in the end also go back in and see the centers that perform well, what does really the patient care cost there compared to other centers? Is there really a money thing, or is it just something that they do differently which doesn't have to cost more? Um, but it's a difficult thing that is definitely not addressed in half a year or already developed even over a few years, I think. If you have anything from cancer. Um, I mean, not directly addressing, but you know, some of the, some of the bundled payment models that were like under our oncology care model are trying to figure out you know, what the cost of care is over the course of the year or the span. And so they, they obviously put in to, to place what that cost would be and what those kind of metrics would be, but I still don't think it's to the scale that you're, you're looking at. I'm conscious that we're up against the clock, and so maybe a uh, final thought, and then uh, we can thank our distinguished panel here. Um, certainly there's a lot of, uh, it's a time of some challenges and some changes in biomedical research and development and with um, some of the policy ch and, and changes coming, and yet, Lyric, thank you. There's tremendous excitement in the gene therapy, gene editing, cell therapy world. I think it really does give us all a uh, great cause for hope into the future. Um, so my thanks to Margaret, Martin, and Lyric for being such 
excellent guests of us here at ASGCT, and to Ted. Thank you very much for co-chair. Maybe we can all give these guys a round of applause.